Please, please watch the end of the video. <laughs> please. There's a reason we're asking you to do that. That's because we're doing a big giveaway at the end of the show for 50 things you should care about in the future. We're for your you, sake, it's a list of 50 things look, you should care about. We only looked at the first like half of the list and it's it's pretty it's impressive. Big. You you guys need to you, you need to look at this list and see the 50 things you have to There's care about. There's more than in the 50, less than 60, and we're going to tell you how to get that at the end of the show. So make sure to stay tuned. We'll tell you how. Um, I didn't realize this, but apparently the Royal Mint came up with a model for moving the UK economy to a cryptocurrency five years ago. Wow. They came up with a whole Research structure of architecture. This podcast is brought to you by our sponsors, Pink.io, the fund of the future where you can earn money in return for learning and forecasting crypto markets. Visit www.pink.io. That's pink spelled with a Y www.pynk.io to find out more. Pink. People powered investment. Welcome to Not Another Crypto Show. Um, we're very lucky today because A, we're missing my co-host with the most. So that gives me great pause because that means more chance for me and more screen time. Angus, if you're watching this, you are an idiot and you should get up earlier. Um, saying that, I was late as well. So thank you, Transport for London, for your incredible opportunity to always be punctual and always show us why our good taxpaying money goes to good causes. We love you, TFL. Turn that around. Um, <laughs> moving swiftly on. The show lately has been gaining popularity because of the guests we bring. And I think it's only right that we keep bringing you then great guests. So we've got a great guest today. If you say who you are, what you do, and a little bit towards our audience, that'd be fantastic. Hi, I'm Rohit Tawa. I'm the CEO of Fast Future. And we do three things. We publish books about the emerging future. We do a lot of advisory and research work for clients, helping them understand what's changing and how you prepare for it. And finally, we speak around the world to leadership audiences to really motivate them to start embracing the changes that are coming. Wow, that's, that's a heck of a lot. So I'm going to unpack that backwards. Um, public speaking. There was a, a, a query, or not query is the wrong word, a survey that went out that said, what are you more afraid of, death or public speaking? And most people said public speaking, which means most people would rather be in the casket than standing in front of the audience speaking <laughs> Telling about, about the, the people in the casket. And that's why you make the big bucks. <laughs> I've heard this. How did that come about? You know, I, I always just enjoyed talking um, to audiences. Mm. I, while I was at university, I trained to be a teacher, not with any intention of so being one, but I did it alongside my degree just so I could learn how to deal with audiences and people because I always sensed that I had the presenter thing yeah. in me. And then got into artificial intelligence when I was at, uh, working, and that led to a lot of presentations internally to just explain what it was. Yeah, and yeah. just loved it, Started moved on to a, a smaller consultancy from a, a very big one, and then started to get a lot of opportunities to, to promote the business. And so I thought conferences were a great way of doing that. Mm. And coming in and talking about new ideas seemed to give you an edge. Uh, and I just discovered that I love the future. I love this idea of not predicting the future, but exploring how it might play out. So I was a child of the, the 60s and 70s, grew up with the moon landings, mm. all sorts of clever technology. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the studio landing. Studio landing. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, but it just, you know, it, it blew my mind that I read a lot of science fiction and mm. it was just like, wow, how would this change our world if any of these ideas came through? And if you look at Star Trek, you know, so much of in Star Trek Absolutely. is now there and so much of the design of what we do today is there. And what we find is that the people we talk to, the clients we work with, the audiences we talk to, just are clueless about the world and how it's changing. Yeah. We reckon that you know, the stuff you guys talk about, Neo, Crypto, mm. Skycoin, DApps, mm. ICOs, TAOs, Stablecoins, AI, shitcoins. All, you know, all of that stuff. I'd say that less than 1% of the planet understands this stuff. Wow. And, and the point is now you need to understand it if, it, if it's going to be the basis of a new, yeah. new world order. Absolutely. So, so we think that there's a real opportunity. And what we spend a lot of our time doing is, A, helping people just understand what are these things, mm. understanding why you should care, and understanding you know what's going on now, and then what do you do about it? Mm. So we act as a translation layer to say, how might these things shape the future? But it's not just the technology stuff. It's also 
the things going on in science, you know, so the incredible advances being made in new materials, uh, biological materials that might clean up environmental damage, wow. uh, the enhancement of the human body, you know, yeah, through yeah. chemical, genetic, electronic and physical Nanotechnology, yeah. everything else. You know, uh, you know cognition enhancing drugs, yes. genetic modification so I can give you better sight, better hearing, whatever. Wow. And the, the world is just desperate to understand this stuff now yeah. so that we can work out what do we do about it. Uh, we in the UK have made a slightly different choice, which is, you know, let's put all that on the side <laughs> and, and, and let's spend all our time not making any yes. progress on Brexit. But you know, the rest of the world is kind of getting on and looking at it. You look like the Finnish government has a, an online tutorial program so that the whole nation can learn about AI. Wow, I did um, not know that. I'm making a note of that. And, and you see around the world people kind of completely reinventing the schooling system that says, you know, the, the world is changing so fast, we can't be creating these economic units of production anymore yeah. who are trained to do specific things and not very well. Um, we have to maximise individual potential. Absolutely. We have to, and so again, you look at places like Finland and Singapore completely changing their education system because they understand how the world is changing. Mm. Uh, and that's really exciting because we also advise governments like the UAE and Singapore on, you know, what does the next 10 years hold and how do you deal with it? And then most of our conversation isn't about the investment in technology. It's about the investment you make in people Amazing. so that we can create what's called a very human future, which by the way, was the title of our last book. And I forgot to bring you a copy. Uh, yes, you did. And I was I was going to mention that, but then I felt guilty because I was late. So I thought yeah, I can't, I'll, I can't I'll post you, you one. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that'd be yeah. lovely. But, yeah. So, you know, we think that that's the big challenge, actually. Progressing the science and technology now is relatively easy because there's so many people around the world with so much brain power. Yeah. We've we've uh, decoupled the the pursuit of scientific and technological advancement from the big companies. Yeah. You know, you can do it in your bedroom. You can do it anywhere. People are willing to invest in you working from your bedroom. It doesn't matter. So, so the rate of advancement in almost every field of science and technology now is exponential. Absolutely. They're all about data. Mm. So that's all coming together and being glued together by things like artificial intelligence that allows us to sequence genomes, invent new drugs. I was watching a bit of video last night about um, robots that teach themselves how to roller skate, uh, how to ice skate, sorry. Uh, and you might think, well, there isn't a big demand for ice skating robots. <laughs> robots but, but actually there is in terms of mountain rescue and, and rescue course. in all sorts of places. And they've just taught these things, really simple things like, mm. you know, you can go forward, backwards and forwards on the ice, but you can't go sideways. Yeah, yeah. And so the robots then learn how to navigate the terrain themselves. It's absolutely mind-blowing what they're doing. That's incredible. Um, so we just, we're just fascinated by all this stuff, and we're trying to help people understand it and then go, how do you, how do you make good choices for individuals and societies that makes sure that the technology and science serves us rather than us becoming, you know, fuel into the machine and ultimately, you know, pick any one of 50 science fiction films where the machines have taken over and the humans 100%. are... 100%. Yeah, yeah. So we're just, you know, so we have this whole focus on a very human future, uh, challenging a lot of the BS that you hear in the marketplace now that says... Um, the control of people is inevitable once you go to technology. Mm. So whether it's big corporations saying, well, it's inevitable that we'll use and abuse your data with surveillance capitalism. Absolutely. Or others saying, well, it, as soon as you have all this technology, then we can control society, you know, like what's going on in China and some of what's going on in Russia and even here. Possibly the US. Yeah. And, and you know, all over, people using video cameras to really start to exercise social control mm. uh, because we just know so much about you once we know who you are. So we're saying, no, this isn't inevitable. You can decouple the amazing advances that we're, we're getting from science and technology from the nefarious use of them or the, 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 the desire to use them for social control. What we can actually do is enrich society and enable society and enable very different possibilities. It does require some rethinking of the capitalist system. Mm, absolutely. Um, it, does rethink, it does rethink, require some rethinking of what our governments are there for. So if you look, you know, now, I mean, we're probably seeing the most inept parliament we've ever seen mm. because faced with the biggest challenge in, in British history in the last 50 plus years, we haven't had a clue how to actually execute the process of enacting a decision made by a, a majority. You know, we'd, instead of saying, okay, let's go and ask the population what they want mm. and have, you know, six months of consultation about well, what did you mean when you voted to stay or mm. when you voted to leave? What mm. is it you wanted? We're talking about Brexit, those listeners out yeah. there that have no idea. Yeah. You know, what is it you, um, 
uh, what is it you want for the future? Mm. Then we could have you know, we could have spent six months doing that. We could still do that. And then you could spend six months going, okay, well, what's a vision for, for a thriving Britain in five years' time? Mm. And, and you start to say, well, we've got incredible new jobs being created. We've got a massively better educated society. We've got the fastest broadband in the world, so we're attracting the coolest businesses of the future. Sure. You know, we're um, massively investing in the in arts education because that's a massive growth sector. You, know, you could have come up with that and then gone, okay, based on that vision, what do we want to do with our relationship with the European Union? Mm. And that vision would have made it a lot easier to go. Well, actually, we we need a customs union. You know, um, we we you know we need some sort of relationship with the single market. What do we need to do about freedom of movement? What do we need to do about blah, 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 blah? And it would have been a lot easier to have a cross-parliamentary discussion then about the elements that enabled that vision of the future. Then you could have gone off to Absolutely. Brussels and Doing gone, work. let's negotiate. And then you go, oh, let's say an exit date. But sensible discourse doesn't sell uh, you know, online videos, does it? You need sound bites. You need, well, uh, for those that don't know, that is our co-host, Angus, who's we need, just arrived. We need political point scoring. You know, that's, that's the game, isn't it? Well, that's the point that political point scoring was a mechanism that kind of worked for the la- for a period that that stopped about two thousand and ten. Really, you know, we also need to, you know, this dialogue would also need to show some understanding of what what are the complexities of the European Union. Just explaining it, like if we leave, we're going to have to deal with air traffic control. We're going to have mm. to deal with medical regulation, pharmaceutical regulation. So, just explaining facts. And also some of what's going on in the Wasn't world. Wasn't that Project Fear, though? Well, you know, that was a terrible part of this process at the moment where it wasn't about – people weren't arguing for Britain's best interest. They were arguing within a very oh. narrow political conversation. And, and I think faced with the kind of crisis we have now, we either make a big crisis decision and then live with the consequences for 20 years – we step back and go, no, let's take two years to sort this out. Mm. Because actually nothing's going to go wrong in that period. That you know, There's no, nothing that means we have to leave the European Union at a certain time. It's a, it's a choice. So let's work out how to do it best. But that's coming from a futurist perspective of, say that. of you know, how many decisions do we live with today that we made in haste in the past 100%. that have caused chaos today? I think one of the, the most uh, profound consequences of Brexit as well is that I spent um, a week a weekend recently mentoring a hackathon for teenagers, um, and there were some kids there who were like preteens as well, and it was shocking how uh, adaptive they were and how quickly they learned things. But also, it was a bit sad because one of the one of the topics was how are we going to you know deal with Brexit as teenagers? Like they didn't vote for it, but they've got to live with the consequences of it, and they were almost all saying it sounds like a pretty silly idea, but. They've, you know, e- even if they were seventeen, they couldn't couldn't vote in the referendum. But they have to live with the consequences of, as you said, probably twenty, thirty years before we even know what it looks like the long term. And I think we knew that it, we kind of knew that when the vote was taken, that that generation weren't going to do well if we just kind of rushed out without thinking. Hmm. Hmm. But that's why we're arguing that you need a visioning per- period where you start and, and a thinking period where you start to say, well, what are we going to do about those people? You know, and the opportunities that are going to be global and their ability to connect and learn from other cultures. If you look at the European, you know, Horizon 2020 research program, it's a massive cultural exchange of ideas. You Obviously, you're working together on research projects, but there's an awful lot, uh, you know, value that comes from working with a French and Italian and a Spanish co-partner on a research project. You just learn to think differently. You learn mm. to understand things differently. And and all of those mechanisms that we have within the U- EU to bring different generations together, we're going to lose. And we needed to think about some of those things instead of this crazy argument that's battled on for two years about, you know, just leaving without really thinking about where we're going. But there's I, also, I think, an, I think there's just a, just a moment to, to um, I had a great fortune of having breakfast with Sir Vince Cable and he was obviously pro stay. And he was talking about what they were doing, and it was with uh, Small Business UK and what small business thinks. And there was a lot of talk about, sorry, clear, clear heads, level heads will prevail in the end. And the obvious nature of staying and the obvious scenarios when it comes to work or cultural changes and how we're so accepting as a nation of younger people and our workforce is younger and they're more open to change and blah, blah, blah. 
But come day of voting, that's not what happened, mm -hmm. which means it's very easy to sit and have a conversation with people who are definitely forward thinking, but they don't seem to be as actionable on their statements because they're not going to vote. And we've seen that with the stats at the end of it. Majority of people of a certain age didn't go and vote, yeah. whereas the older generation, who probably had less of an understanding and didn't have to worry about 20 years from now because they might not be with us in 20 years, kind of went, we will vote because we know that's how change is made. And that's why I think you, you can't base an entire strategy simply on the vote. Agreed. You needed to then get out into the country and understand the mood. Yeah. So you needed to be in places like Sunderland and, you know, South End and, yeah. and London and the big cities and really understand different perspectives in each place about, well, what do you want? And, and, and what do you want for the future? And also have used mechanisms. There are lots of good dialogue mechanisms where you can hear the other side. Mm. You don't have to agree with them, but at least understanding the different perspectives would have, would have made some difference. And you can also debunk some of the myths that are out there. They did try that. Again, and to, to quote to that exact breakfast, Small Business uh, UK had gone out and done something like, at that stage, 88 events around the country to show both sides, to open up mm -hmm. conversation, to debunk. Um, and that breakfast was kind of at the end of that. And at that stage, they were quite confident that based on those discussions, we were going to remain. It wasn't that. And yet the news and everything else said, no, you're not. You know, it was very much the opposite. And I, my argument was louder voices normally get fed. That's part of it. I mean, I, I suspect that going and talking to the business community, you got perspective from people ah, who saw the true. value. You've got a different, you're not talking to people who are disenfranchised. That's my guy producer. So you're not talking to the man in the street, you're talking to business. Mm. Businesses are kind of faceless, and that's kind of seemingly a lot of the reason people wanted to leave, because it's all focused on the business, not yeah. the family or the people. I don't know. It's a... And you only have to look at what's going on in France at the moment. Actually, it's been going on for a couple of years, but yeah. the protests, and it's spreading around Europe. And the level of disenfranchisement you're seeing, to understand that perhaps our biggest challenge going forward is this combination of uh, a, a population that feel like it's being underserved and it doesn't have access to this shiny future that's being painted. And on the other hand, um, successive governments and leadership of, you know, all sorts of organisations that are supposed to help us there that, that are not competent enough to manage the change. So they're not mm. willing to invest in their own training. They're not willing to invest in their own understanding and so i feel like we're, we're using you know almost 18th 19th century political mechanisms of just arguing across the house to deal with a very 21st century problem about how do you map the future of an economy and an increasingly digitized world where science and technology plays a bigger part in value creation it's it's the basis on which most economies are are, are saying they're going to grow and, and serve their population but a massive disconnect in terms of understanding of what those things will do. I'd like to quote Nicola Sturgeon here, though, when she Please said, do. Brexit means breakfast. <laughs> I think that's something that we can all agree on. What? I don't know what that even meant. She did a TV interview. She was like, Brexit means breakfast. breakfast. Right. <laughs> what did she mean? No, no, she, she misspoke. She, she misspoke. She, was, she said that Brexit means so breakfast. Are we taking this moment of our Brexit listeners and watchers' time purely to poke fun at a politician? No, I, it's a great quote, though. It's a, and Actually, you know what? There's something happening tomorrow, I think, which is a Brexit-themed breakfast event where they have different kinds of breakfast. So there's a Canadian option, which has got, like, maple syrup and bacon. I'm going to take there's you straight from breakfast Brexits, and Brexit breakfast. to blockchain, Let's the third B. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we talk a lot on the show about the blockchain and about cryptocurrencies. My question to you as a futurist, why do you think the blockchain hasn't been taken up? We talk about the top 1% understanding technology as it is. Well, it seems less than that, at least from mine. Obviously, I'm a different audience to Angus. But my audience has any understanding of A, what the blockchain is, B, why it's important, and C, why it isn't jumped on like the internet was, which is what blockchain is supposedly 3.0 of the internet. So I think there's a number of things wrapped up in it. One is just a sheer lack of understanding of what it is, because it it is quite a complex concept to understand in mm. terms of this idea of encoding data in a in a block and it having some relationship to previous blocks and it being immutable and 
It's quite a lot going on there. And it's decentralized. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it and, it is hard to explain to people. And then yeah. anyone who starts talking about blockchain is genetically incapable of staying on the subject. Right? So I've they, noticed that. They dive into that, you know, decentralized applications, tokenized architectures. They, and because they want to prove that what they're doing is different, mm. they also, you know, we get a bit of Ethereum thrown in, mm. we get a bit of this, bit of that. And it's just confusing. Secondly, uh, and so most people don't have the headspace to, to get it. Um, and even if they get it, they need it to be explained to them again several times. Secondly, there are very few examples of it being used in a way that the person out there would understand. The general, yeah, pop. yeah. So there's lots of examples of like self-referential examples of it being used within the blockchain community to do stuff that the blockchain community wants. It's a bit like quantum computing. I was about to say. Most quantum computing is being used to prove whether or not the, quantum, the thing is quantum. Correct. Or not. Um and and then um, it's still quite slow, you know. The the most of the architectures, as as they're explained to people, are much slower. They consume more energy, you know. And then there's always this figure quoted about how many you know transactions can you do on a blockchain versus how many can Visa or Mastercard process in a second. And, and is then it higher or lower? Sorry, as a, as a generally not. we're told that it's it's like a factor of ten higher for Visa and Mastercard, wow. and you know. Um, at least. Uh, and then people say, well, you've got this and that and that. Uh, but, you know, the reality is that there's there's nothing out there that's, that is that is truly blowing people away as a, a robust You, you probably production. couldn't use, like, the, any of the established blockchain technologies yeah. to do <clears throat> payment processing on a global scale like Visa or MasterCard do. Got at, you. at present, like today, you probably couldn't do it. So, and, and then there's the energy requirements because you've kind of got this decentralized architecture. So there's a whole bunch of things. And then there's also the establishment, you know, that whether you're the IT department in a company, whether you're the banking system in a country, most of the time the the, the move to blockchain moves the power away from you to the blockchain developers and the mm. designers, the thinkers, and actually, you realize that most of what you're doing is, is not required. I'll give you a simple example. Um, we, one of our clients is in um, commodities training, everything from coal and iron ore to grain and, and tea. And they turn over $5 billion a year. They only make a 2% profit on that. Um, uh, and they're basically trading goods around the world based on imperfect information. You know, you need grain. Mm. I happen to know there's some over here, but you don't, so I can buy it and sell it to you at a bit of a yeah. margin. Now there are lots of platforms that are basically connecting, you know, the farmers or the, the coal miners mm -hmm. onto a blockchain platform. So then the people who want to buy it, you know, can get on there. The shippers can be on there. You can just do the deal electronically on blockchain, almost entirely automated, and it rips out the, the, the traders in the middle. And they, they, you know, turkeys don't vote for an early Christmas. So they're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're resisting these things coming in. So there's a lot of that. And there's a lot of conservatism. I, mean, I didn't realize this, but apparently the Royal Mint came up with a model for moving the UK economy to a cryptocurrency five years ago. Wow. They came up with a whole Research structure and architecture. <laughs> um, That's going in the quote. Uh, yeah. And um, But you don't get paid to rock the boat, do you? Yeah, exactly. And if you're making money doing something, why would you find a new way to do it that so you might exactly. not be able to make money at? So anymore? all those vested yeah. interests and all those it's fear and uh, lack of knowledge, they all combine to make it... Um, to create barriers mm. to the progress of blockchain. So the blockchain community is trying to do its thing, but it's also doing stuff that, that scares people like ICOs. Mm. And you have an awful lot of scams. And therefore, and it's so tied up with cryptocurrency, which no one understands either, that inevitably you're just making it harder for that to make progress but what you're seeing now is a lot of big companies and unfortunately this tends to be the way a lot of big companies now are going okay you know we've got about five years maybe 10 left at best let's now invest in a whole portfolio of businesses that might eat our lunch in the future mm. and let's let's nurture those things and you know we'll basically gradually move to those businesses and the great thing is you know we don't they hardly employ any people, you know, they're, they're these so-called decentralized autonomous organizations with no employees. And therefore, we can make that shift. We can take all the people off our payroll and we can create these hyper efficient, theoretically, businesses mm. that make us a lot more money. So you're starting to see a bunch of businesses get it. 
very few, as far as I can see, are doing it from an altruistic thing of saying. <laughs> I had this conversation. You know, let's recently. create a blockchain-based economy that's tran- you know, that, that transparent, transparent, blah, 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 all blah, these blah, buzzwords we use on the show. Bullshit. You know, yeah. <laughs> that's not why they're going there. It's because no. ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. We think there's going to be an awful lot of money in there. So and there are lots of use cases across every industry. You know, we were talking about uh, educa- we were talking about education earlier. We were talking about the music industry. There are so many places where you can start to see the value of a totally secure mechanism for transferring core data. Yeah. Can I ask you one more question? I'm sure this will have one for you. Um, you said you're a child of the 60s and 70s. Yeah. So you've seen the same thing happen with the internet and then websites. You know, I remember, because I'm old, you know, the the first time someone said, I'm going to build a website for you. And I was like, hold on a second. So you're going to build me an online shop that sells, I was into printed promotional clothing, that does printed promotional clothing. Yeah. But every time I need to fix it or change it, I have to come to you. And this was back before, you know, Mm. Wix or GoDaddy and all these places that make Squarespace. Big shout out. If you want to pay for us this advertising, we're happy to take your money. (laughs) Um, But I had to trust this web guy who was like the black arts to fix my website. And then if if he wanted extra money, he or she in this case, mostly it was men, they'd sort of say, hold on a second. You know, we're going to hold... Unless you give us more, we're not going to update your website. So that was a decentralized thing at the time, right? That was a the concept of of control of <laughs> thanks of control of information and exposure and holding your business back almost to ransom, which I think people are worried about with this new world. If you were in charge of the future, what could you? What do you think you could do? What action would you put in place that would create a foster adaption to the blockchain world and that world of crypto that we talk about in the show? It has to be around education. It's, it's the first piece that we, you know, we ought to be um, almost making it compulsory that the entire population learns about this stuff. I mentioned earlier Finland, you know, with AI, and I'm sure they'll do the same with blockchain. But we need to get the whole population, like, learning about these technologies. We need to be using media more, creating local training courses, maybe tying it to your, you know, if you're on benefits or whatever, giving you a tax break if you're working to say, you know, if you if you go on a course now to learn about this stuff, you know, six weeks, one hour a week, or whatever, um, we'll give you something back, you know, we'll give you more that helps you then grow. I think we need to be looking at how we build it into the education system more and explaining not just blockchain, but it's, it's about the science and technology that could shape our future because they're becoming so, you know, so fundamental. Once you understand the science and technology, then you can understand some of the ideas that sit on top of it. Mm. You know, then you can understand the idea of, you know, getting paid in tokens that are just as valuable as cash. You know, that... Which tokens are they? <laughs> just, just, just asking for a friend. Well, right? let's, let's make some up. Let's we'll make some up. You know, I, I lose my job. Uh, I then go into a community project, pacing, painting houses, yeah, I'm sure you you know, <laughs> gardening or whatever. But I can use those tokens to buy an airline ticket or to buy food or whatever. Um, and you know, we're going to see a lot more mediums of exchange emerge. Yeah, and, and uh, because in a world where people don't get cash. There'll be other things that we get paid in. So we need people, before they can understand that, they need to understand the technologies that enable it, and, the, and then they can understand the ideas. Can I play devil's ad- advocate Just, please for a do. minute here? People don't want to learn. They don't want to learn about things, you know? They've got a phone in their pocket. It's always giving them notifications and stuff. I think we should get some celebrity influencers. The question was, what would he do if he was in control of the future? I'll ask you the same question. What would you do if you could control the future? It's not one, I don't think it's one, just one mechanism. Celebrity influencers will reach certain parts of society. There's others who need to leave. Because we always think, oh, who doesn't understand blockchain? And we Mm, tend to think about illiterate people on a housing estate, you know, is is often the view. Actually, the people we need to understand are the investment bankers who make so much money they don't need to care. The lawyers, the accountants, the politicians, the people who run businesses, that there's an awful lot of people in society, you know, people who are running, like, let's say, a 20 person business, they've been doing what they've been doing for a while. They don't understand this stuff. Apparently, they don't even really understand IT in general. Well, that's the thing. So, you need a massive bump in literacy. I don't think you can. Can we trick people into learning, do you think? Well, you can. I mean, Cameron talked about nudge, and that was a similar sort of thing. Yeah. You know, we can incentivize, we can nudge, we can trick, we can entice i think you need a lot of experiments to see what seems to work mm. uh, and what what engages people again because the issue is not that people don't want to learn 
it's that their, their lives have become, I think, so busy, they become so enwrapped in what's going on yeah. that they don't give themselves permission to use any of their spare time for learning. Correct. They just they're just, you know, vegging out or they're doing whatever or just they just want to party. Well they're stuck in the matrix. They're they're on a stream. They're following a, a Facebook feed. They're yeah. they're, you know, twitching. They're doing all these other things. Yeah, don't tell them not to do that though, because like, you know, we we're creating content for the internet. So <laughs> keep Stop streaming. watching this. Stop, Stop watching. learning. <laughs> keep streaming. Use well, your time. You know, that's the kind of that's yeah, the one. kind of problem that someone like Zuckerberg has when he says we want people to use less Facebook. Can we really. quickly, because we've only got a minute left of the show, um, give you a plug for coming down here. Can you tell our audience where they can find out about more, where they can find out about your services and, and get in touch? Yeah, if you go to www, start again, <laughs> www.fastfuture.com, you'll see our books. Uh, it's a terrible website, but it's being rebuilt. But you'll see our books. You'll see about the consulting and research work we do, and you'll see about the uh, the, the speaking we do for different types of audiences and the the, the types of events we create to help people engage with the future. We've been lucky enough to have him here and we can definitely give a two thumbs up endorsement for that, even half a thumbs up for half a show. But thank you for following. <laughs> Do subscribe, hit that bell button so you can find out more about the shows that we have when we have them that you're not left behind in the past. And welcome to the future. This podcast is brought to you by our sponsors, Pink.io, the fund of the future where you can earn money in return for learning and forecasting crypto markets. Visit www.pink.io, that's pink spelt with a Y, www.pynk.io to find out more. Pink, people-powered investment. <laughs>